It's uh, Jonas Hassan Kimiri. Yeah, in yeah. Swedish you would say Jonas Hassan Kimiri. And in uh, Arabic, I guess you would say Jonas Hassan Kimiri, you know, but anywhere between is also fine. Great. I, in Swedish, I would say Jonas. 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 Okay. Yeah. Actually, I like that, so I might keep that in. Yo- Jonas Hassan Kimiri is one of Sweden's most exciting contemporary writers. His fiction and plays have been widely translated and produced, and his prize-winning latest novel, Everything I Don't Remember, became an international bestseller. We're here at the Blue Mat Literary Festival in Montreal. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. We were just talking about Jean, the Icelandic poet and writer. He self-published his first book of poetry at age 15 or 16. I wonder how you got started. Well, I, I remember having kind of similar ideas when I was a kid, you know, the, kind of thinking of the publishing industry as them, you know, very far from, from who I was. And I just kept thinking, I think in a way to kind of console myself if they wouldn't want to publish me that you know if they don't want to publish me I can just you know print up a bunch of copies and go around in in a van in Sweden and just like force people to buy my work um, <laughs> it's funny you know he did it on the bus oh well wow. he actually sat on the buses and sort of sat down beside people started reading them his poetry and that's how yeah but I've always been more into novels so I guess I would have to write a really good first chapter and get them hooked from the first sentence. Right. Um, but um, I guess what I, how I got into writing was that I, I, I've always written. Uh, I started with a personal diary when I was a kid and then as I got older I had this kind of big important project that was going to be my debut and you know that was going to change the Swedish literary scene forever and ever Um, and I worked on that uh, book way too long and I think I also tried to impress my idea of editors with that project so it was a project that never really it didn't feel like it came from me in some ways it felt like I wrote it for someone else so you were ambitious (sighs) yeah I I've always loved writing but I realized after having finished the first thing, you know, that never amounted to, it never became like a real book or it was never published. But I remember the first time when I handed that project in, that was the first time I kind of showed my writing to someone else. And just remember the feeling of standing on Sveavägen in Stockholm, like putting this kind of big chunk of text into the mailbox and realizing even before it kind of hit the bottom of the mailbox I just felt like this is not it this is not it's not you it's, it's not written. me yeah, yeah exactly yeah. It's, this is something that I have you know in some ways written to show my literary in, lit, literary influences so there were a number of like names that were like anagrams and there were like hidden references to Calvino or Faulkner or Baldwin. like I don't know it was it just felt dead in some ways so mm-hmm. I think in order to protect kind of most, false. yeah, and I think that in order to protect myself from, a, you know, them maybe saying no, I went home and I started thinking. So what would I write for me? And that ultimately is what became my first novel. Um, so this big work was rejected roundly, was it? Yeah. Well, I got, the, you know, there are like three in Sweden. We have like, I guess everywhere there's this the three levels of you know the 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 letter that is just like a formalized letter that tells you don't contact us again kind yeah, of, and then yeah. there's a kind of the personalized letter saying well there's something here and then the third level i guess is you're brilliant we want you so mm-hmm. i that first project got this second type letter um, okay. from the two big publishers so a bit of encouragement then. exactly like yeah. for me it was so important just the first it was the first time that i sh- you know told anyone that i was writing so, so to have two actual editors contact me was amazing. How old were you? So this was um, in the... F- I was 21. Yeah, it's, 19, it's the fall of 99. So I graduated in 97. Then I took two years off kind of having 
you know, can, weird jobs, traveling, uh, writing. And then I handed in that first script. And when they returned to me with kind of comments or suggestions, I just said, well, actually, I got a new thing now. <laughs> and I showed them that text, and that, that was ultimately what became my first novel. Okay. In Swedish, it's called Ett Ögarat, which is like one red eye, maybe one eye red. You referenced uh, Calvino and Faulkner. Mm. You also have said that you find a lot of inspiration from stories that are that are difficult to locate on the comedy tragedy mm. Mm. scale. If you could expand on that a bit, why does that uh, inspire you? I think I've always liked things that create some kind of ambiv- ambivalence within me. You know, when I'm kind of laughing, not really sure why I'm laughing, or when I, when I'm kind of surprised by my own reaction. That can be, you know, watching stand-up. That can be reading a short story by George Saunders. That can be a feeling of, of, yeah, someone taking a hold of me and me losing control. I guess. And you don't understand why. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's something about this form that kind of creates that kind of that makes me. Uh, yeah, behave weirdly in some ways. Um, what, what about George Saunders then? What, what, give a specific. I think he's really talented in the way of kind of creating a fiction where, where there is a lot of energy and in so many of his short stories there is this tenderness that never falls into cliché. And I'm not really sure how he does it, but I think that, that that's... You know, you have all these writers that you admire, and then you, in some ways, you kind of, you know, try to filter them through you and create something that is you. And I think that one of the things that I'm really interested in, both my fiction and my plays, is this, like, how, how to use humor. Um, I come from a family where, where we've used a lot of humor to kind of get out of binds, or, you know, that there's been, like, no situation that has been serious or sad enough to not crack a joke um, and when that joke is kind of coming from a place of panic or fear or sadness it has a lot of energy I guess um, mm-hmm. so yeah, dark humor is always uh, yeah. Sort of yeah touching a real deep yeah I'm kind of chord humor to get out of pain pain and a situation that you can't control and um, that keeps coming back in my work, I think. Right. I'm not sure which uh, Stoic Roman uh, suggested that that's the best way to live life Mm -hmm. is a sort of a detached, cheerful, humorous view of the world. Otherwise, you get bogged down in all the pain and suffering. Yeah. One of the other uh, sort of topics that... uh, that I guess uh, intrigues you is how we remember people who have died mm. and what kind of memories we cling on to and what, what we actually forget. So maybe you could ex- expand on that. Yeah, I think that I came to writing with, with a fascination about the, there was something about words that I remember as a kid that they were always around. You know, like if life felt... Uh, weird or sad or that uh, you experienced things that were, that were kind of painful, you could kind of leave the ordinary world and go to the book, book text world and um, the alphabet was always there. Uh, yeah. I remember as a kid that I, I had a number of people in my family who were kind of very present and important to me in periods and then during some periods, they were not able to be present. They were not able to be in close to our family, so to speak. And then I remember quite actively, instead of both, of course, remembering them, but also writing about them in order to call them back, you know, as a way of kind of, yeah, giving them a new life, but also kind of hang, just hanging out with them uh, yeah. through me writing about them. So I think that kind of comes back in the novels, um, Oftentimes there are people missing and then someone tries to replace them with words or as in the latest novel published in English called Everything I Don't Remember, there's this, we meet a young man whose name is Samuel who we know has passed away and then the whole book consists of what he has left behind memory-wise. 
So there's a writer going around talking to everyone who knew Samuel and they remember him, they tell their version of who he was. And the problem, of course, is that they remember him very differently. So he becomes kind of a different person in everybody's uh, recollection. And you also suggest that the way they're recollecting uh, Samuel is m more a reflection of who they are than of who Samuel is. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really interesting to, to kind of having a look at how we remember things and how that reflects maybe not who we are, but who we dream to be, you know, or who, um, um, who we would like to be. Um, I think the fuel in that particular novel comes from this, the feeling of guilt that everyone has. What that, could I have done to help exactly, save like him? The moment you lose someone, it could be a friend, it could be a pet, it could be like um, the moment someone is, leaves a void in your life, the next question is, what could I have done differently? Mm -hmm. Could I have called yeah. more? Could I have been more present? The pain of realizing that you can't go back. Yeah, he's gone. It's gone. Yeah. And then you have to cling on to what's left. And that's the recollection. And that's very quickly it becomes almost like a life, life or death uh, situation where you have to cling on to your idea of who that person was. All of these people, the friend, the ex-girlfriend, the family, they keep remembering him in a light that reduces their guilt. That makes them look better. Yeah. You know, in my life, when I have, whenever I have lost someone, my impulse has always been to try in some kind of, well, I'm a writer, so it's not too weird, but, but, but also kind of having that ambition to may maybe I can write them back, like kind of collecting my memory of that person, writing it down really quickly to kind of, of course, making them permanent, making yeah. them immortal. immortal. And very quickly realizing that I'm not telling the whole truth. I'm telling a romantic idea of who I would have liked them to be, or I'm telling recollections where I'm not a guilty uh, person. Or where yeah, I'm you haven't done anything wrong. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, but if you realize yeah. that, you can you can write it more accurately, no? In a way, yeah. I think in the novel, I think all of these people kind of reveal themselves by what they are trying to convince the person who's listening of. That was a long sentence in English. But yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you know, following. Uh, I think that, for example, just like a practical example, so we have the ex-girlfriend called Lida, who's like desperately trying to convince the listener or the reader that she was really in love with Samuel. Like, I, I was really in love. Really in love. Mm -hmm. Someone who was really in love, that does... She she, he or she really have to do that? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's um, like protesting over much. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like, um, like Vanda also says, like, I, I don't care about money. Like, money is not an object to me. I don't, I don't even think about money. You know, we all have the, these people in our life who keep saying, kind of on repeat, that they don't care about money. After a while, you start thinking that maybe m money is a thing. <laughs> you know, maybe, yeah, yeah. Maybe, um, and Vanda is someone who's actually quite focused on economic transaction transactions so you're also a playwright and uh, obviously there's a difference in writing a writing a novel and a play you find it easier to write plays because you're able to visualize the bodies more easily or what, what's the difference I think I see this some my writing as some kind of crop rotation where I need to have a novel kind of um, marinating or growing uh, in order to be really happy and um, my main job is a, I see myself as a, as a novelist then from time to time after having left a novel project I go to write a play or a short story or I recently was involved in co-writing a movie script but that's not my real job that's like um, you know like a, a crop that I introduce to hopefully make my novel writing better in the right. end kind of like sharpen my tools in a way sure um, different perspective. Yeah, and in, right. in theater you can, can try out things. You know, you can things that you know. There are a number of differences. Of course, we have the bodies. We have the po possibility to control speed. That is difficult to do in a book. You know, like um, yeah. What what what's that about? Because I know speed is important to you. I don't, I don't understand though. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, I think I'm. A, I don't have 
too much patience. Um, so one of the things that I'm interested in is kind of, is it possible to, how do you write speed? Uh, in this, in everything I don't remember, I was fascinated with speed because Samuel actually dies in a car crash. Like he, he dies of speed, you know. And it, well, we think he does. He also could have killed himself, but it's yeah, still but speed. It's yeah. still, he's yeah. still dead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how do you, how do you get speed into a novel? Well, maybe one way is of switching perspectives quite quickly. That's one way, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe one way is to, um, yeah, to, to try to visualize a novel that Samuel would have wanted. Uh, because Samuel is also someone who's quite impatient. He doesn't have a lot of... He always wants something else. Yeah. He, yeah, he wants experiences, but he never... He never uh... Get, gets enough out of them. Yeah, yeah, I think that one of the things that he he has this kind of panicky feeling that everything is just fleeting away. That all his memories and all his recollections and all his experiences are just like nothing is stable. And he feels very isolated as well. He feels like no one is kind of he feels like he uh, is not connected to people around him. In the end, the book becomes a testament to his to the fact that he's actually very wrong. He's very much a part of this world and he's deeply connected to people who, the people who are surrounding him. I'm just looking for a, qu yeah. a quote from uh, the, the critic, uh, Daniel Mendelssohn, yeah. who uh, admired Stendhal's uh, Charterhouse of Parma. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things he said was that was, let's see, at once spontaneous and premeditated, quick pace of narrative, vividness of characters, balanced by sardonic assessment of human nature and, and politics, impetuousness and forward movement, urgent, impatient style, vibrant characters, prey to unruly emotions. Sounds to me like that's what you're, you know, he's, he's mm. getting at with the mm. speed mm. thing. Is that right? You just want to, con you want to convey this sense of urgency and. Yeah, I want. I think speed was important when I was writing it, and also feeling of trying to capture what it feels like when you are calm, when you get the, the message that someone has died. Um, I would have loved to tell this story in like a base, you know, like a third person. Um, you know, it all started one dark evening, but my feeling every time I've lost someone is that it feels really chaotic, you know, and, and, yeah, it's and like, it's, well, I can't make sense of things and there are yeah. like n a number of different voices kind of passing through me and... Um, I, I find that it's it's like surreal. Mm. Life is surreal. Yeah. Here I had someone very very close to me. Yeah. And now they disappeared. Yeah. It's like that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And this person is forever gone, but weirdly present, right? Because you see that person everywhere you go. You everything yeah. you see. There's s reminders. Everything yeah. you kind of see around you makes that person come alive again. So weirdly enough, someone dies, they become also very present. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, and also when you remind, like th little things, you come across the, you know, you sort of get over the initial shock. Yeah. And then there's some kind of little reminder, like an old email that you see. Yeah. yeah. As if yeah. they're still around. And it's, yeah. it, yeah. it is, it's shocking. Yeah. It's uh, jolting. Yeah. Yeah, to this day I have, you know, the impulse of calling people who are not alive or, you know, just writing a short text to someone who, um, because it's very hard to internalize the, the death of someone. And I think in, in the novel, I think that people are really struggling with the pain of not being able to go back in time. Where is the only place where you can go back in time? Well, writing is... <laughs> rather good place you know you could actually go back and rewrite the history you can kind of go back and tweak it a little bit yeah and, then, and i think that is why they are so it becomes really important for them to tell their version but for you to to, to become their voice 
In a way, yeah. And of course, I, I am all of them, or, or I understand all of them. And then, not to spoil too much, but towards the end of the novel, we also realize that actually the writer has used Samuel to, to tell, yeah, the, the memories of Samuel turn out to be the memories of the writer. So we also understand that that you kind of usurp their lives in a way. You, in a way yeah. That's what Philip Roth talks about. Yeah. You know, like sort of you, you uh, not savage, but you you're kind of a, a vulture when it comes to other people's experiences. Yeah. Yeah. In your family, particularly. Yeah. Yeah. I I find that it's impossible to kind of write yourself free of your own experiences but um, all good writers you know of course write from some kind of you need to write out of some kind of understanding or sympathy and I can honestly say that I really understand all these characters like I have great love for Vanda and Lyda and, and Samuel the, the, the three main characters um, and also it's, it's fun to see like the number of things that I see afterwards popping up in the novel. Like, as I was writing it, I had the experience of my grandmother who was losing her memory really quickly. And I remember thinking that it was quite weird that to me, writing has many times felt like a port to freedom. You know, you could go to writing and you can kind of free yourself from everyday life. Mm -hmm. And what happened to her when she started losing her memory was that she had the exact opposite. She kind of started writing down small notes that he, she posted all over her house in order to kind of make to find herself again you know to, to make to remember yeah to remember and make things stable mm. so for her words meant you know security and um, finding her way back to herself and to me words i think at least in the beginning of my career, career was much more a thing that i saw as an an emergency exit from life in some ways. Um, and that dynamic, I think that there's a, that dynamic comes alive in the novel, that people use words for different purposes. Mm -hmm. Did you not like your life uh, when you were young? Uh, I think to... life is okay. <laughs> you did, do you feel like you wanted to escape from it though? Or? Yeah, yeah, very often I, I felt like... Uh, and why I, is that? Well, this morning I, I saw this an amazing installation here in Montreal, called the Chalk Room by Laurie Anderson, kind of an interactive virtual reality room. Hmm. And it it's was the film director. Yeah, you're kind of flying around inside a story, a three-dimensional story, hmm. using the, you know, like virtual reality mask. And it was amazing. And stepping out of that, you had this kind of weird feeling that the outside world was less real than the inside world. You know that that. I would mm. love to go back inside and just stay there. It was more intense? Uh, more intense and realer. You know, it, it felt well, realer it? to be on the ins. Like it felt, yeah. It, What's the definition of realer? That I could fly. That's not real, though. Well, maybe, maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you know, I guess. Um, no, but I, I, um, and I, I just step, stepping out linking back to writing, I felt like, wow, this is what reading was like when I was a kid. That was the feeling that, you know, when I picked up a book, mm -hmm. I was so immersed yeah. in it mm -hmm. that everything outside of it felt yeah, I've had false, that. you know. And yeah. to this day, when I think about my school years, I have fictional characters that feel whatever real is, realer, mm -hmm. you know, than yeah. I barely remember like the people in my, you know, when I was like 12 years old. But I, if you ask me about the fictional characters that I spend time with, they are very three-dimensional, you know. Yeah. Um, so that role, like mm. writing and, and text have always, they've played that role in my life. Yeah, there's a definition of uh, quite a few writers, uh, when they're asked why they write, it's, it's the recuperation of what time takes away from us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or to give voice to people or issues that don't have a voice of their own, mm. I guess. I've never had that 
that has never been my it's just come out of a feeling of if I don't do it I'm not happy yeah you know so it's a pleasure principle yeah survival tactics um, you've you've talked about uh, the fact that you're you're sort of more oral or uh, audio focused and that you do hear voices and that you listen to them is is that a bit like you know Mozart just sort of sitting there and the music pours into him from heaven and he just writes it out or is that a bit too dramatic well I always like to compare myself to Mozart it's, it's just I remember as a kid I went to like a reading of a Swedish writer who I really liked who's that? Peter Kielgård uh, he wrote a beautiful book called Anvisningar till en far Directions to a father it's a beautiful novel that I read as a kid is it in English? Oh, I don't think so no. oh, okay uh, maybe one day, thanks yeah. to this podcast. Uh, it's just a beautiful short short book, and I went to a reading of his, and he talked about writing, and he said something, you know, like you have to f- follow your inner voice or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking that that's not, that it just felt weird. What is that? What's, what's an inner voice? Weirdly religious in some ways. And then uh, when I... The first time I started a project that came alive on its own, it very much felt like I was listening to the inner voice or the voices from somewhere. Or it was very much an act of disappearing, actually. Um, it felt like I disappeared and that all of a sudden there were this... The text kind of took a hold. Um, and that was an amazing feeling. That, of course, that, that's a very rare feeling. It's happened like for every project that I've published it's happened once and when that happens you feel like oh you know he, here it is finally it's here but of course I have tons of projects where that never happens and then you know you kind of put them in the folder of projects that I spend too much time on that never amounted to anything mm. um, there's like grace almost it's a gift that you can't summon up yeah you know we're, we're, to me mm. to me that's that's how it's been. Maybe one day I will become another sort of writer who can just like map out things and do like dramatical curves or whatever. <laughs> it's, I'm, 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 I'm not there yet. In the novel that we were talking about, we'll get the name of it here, yeah. Everything I Don't Remember, it's very difficult to tell, certainly for the first hundred pages or so, who's talking. And we're not sure exactly who's telling the truth. I kind of felt that that's very very Nietzschean, mm. you know, that the that, that truth is perspective. Yeah. Were you affected by Nietzsche at all or not? No, I think I, coming from the theater, every voice has a mouth. Mm-hmm. Every word is being said by someone, right? You see right. that it comes from a body, you see the face and the shape or the age of that person. Yeah. The thing that I really like about books is that you have to do that work on your own. As a reader, you have to fill that body. You hear that voice in your head, and you, in the books that I love, I feel like a co-creator of what is of, of the fictional world. You know, I'm actually stepping into it, and I'm, I'm hearing that voice in my head, and I have to construct a person who is behind those words. What happens if I, as a writer, don't say that, you know, person who's saying this is a 65 year old grandmother if there is a phrase in the book someone says I really loved him I really loved him if I don't like if I'm going to tell you it's a grandmother okay you have one version of it if I tell you actually it's Lida his ex-girlfriend okay that's that phrase becomes something different right if it's his best friend Bandad then that friend that phrase becomes something else um, and I'm really fascinated by that, those kind of few seconds of insecurity, what they do to a reader. Well, it's also frustrating being a reader, too. Yeah, and maybe yeah. that's what you want. I don't know. Uh, I, my goal is not to frustrate, but maybe to get the feeling of, like, you have to create this with me. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. These are to... Lego blocks, and you have to put them together. 
they don't exist without you. You know, if I'm going to give you like the in actuality, the the there's the no structure. work. Yeah, if you give it to the to everything, then there's no work on the part of the reader. Is that it? No, much more that that this is how um, the structural react is actually quite simple. Like every other section is vandad, and then. Um, we kind of follow the writer as he's mapping Samuel's last day alive. But um, I really enjoy as a writer when I'm not completely sure who is saying what, because it enables me, I think, to kind of not trust my preconceived ideas about things. And it's just a matter of tastes. Yeah. There are many different books, and there are tons of books who where you don't have to do this. And I, you know, then, then I think you know, they're, they're, um, hopefully there are some people who like this kind of book as well. You know? <laughs> well, they definitely <laughs> are, because it's, a, it's an international bestseller. So. Well, so. <laughs> I don't know who said that. But <laughs> uh, well, I guess your royalty check might say some of it. I have quite a big readership in, in my home country, but I'm... Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm how I'm big are you in Sweden? Like, are you big, big news in Sweden? Yeah, I have a big, like, I I had the, uh, you know, my first novel sold really well, and I've had, I've lived as a writer ever since, so yeah, now I've done big. this for 15 years, but I... I guess, and if they make it into a movie or a miniseries, then, you know, yeah. that's a whole new level of yeah. fame. I, I think that um, a lot of people in Sweden, one of the things that the success in Sweden brought me, I think, was I try to always translate it into courage. Confidence? I think so, yeah, yeah, because I, I'm, I'm generally not like a courageous person, but I, I think that if I'm proud of something is that jusqu'ici um, tout bien, like it's, it's been gone, going really well, and, and, and for every project that has gone well, I've kind of thought of it as Okay, now I really, I have the time to write a couple of weird books before they right. you know, shoot me down or decide not to publish me anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that has give, given me the liberty to kind of... That's great. Not, not really care about, about you know, basically writing the books that I, that I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. uh, the character, our character Samuel, emerges as a, as, as a sort of multifaceted, contradictory man. Yeah. He's loving, he's a frustrated grandson, he's a loyal friend, um, a reluctant bureaucrat, a poser. That kind of put me in mind of uh, Odysseus in the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Sort of identity is difficult to pin down. Yeah, yeah. He's also kind of a Zelig character. You remember that old Woody Allen movie? That, that, you know, he's kind of, especially, there's something weird about his voice. Hmm. Whenever he switches settings, he starts speaking differently. So if he were like speaking to an old lady, he starts using the words of that old lady. When he speaks to someone who has kind of a more uh, comes from a poorer background, he starts using using those words. Yeah, he mirrors he were, them exactly. So if he were in this room speaking to us, he would maybe start quoting uh, Nietzsche <laughs> or yeah, right, you know, right. Um, so he's a chameleon. Then, yeah, it? it's, he has he has a chameleon like fe uh, feel to him, and I can really relate to that. You know, as as we all do, we mm -hmm. we tend to mirror the setting that we're yeah, we're we're, we're different people, or not. There's, there's yeah. not just one. Yeah, one of the interesting things that I found when writing this, and also when I've lost people in my past, is that. Every time you lose someone, the people who are kind of remembering them, that you keep fighting for, you, like the details of who they really were. Like I knew that person really well because I knew that he or she liked that kind of music. Or, um, and in the book, we realized that he was actually many different persons. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and it's up to, I think, you know, if if the novel works, I think it's it, it gives us as readers the feeling that we have to construct him in kind of a three D puzzle. Um, he's complicated. He's complex. Yeah, yeah. I just <laughs> me me personally, I really like those kinds of kinds of books. Also, when I, when when I get a feeling that someone is is more than just um, a shell. 
Yeah, it's interesting. The, the characters don't really come into focus until, I'd say, about you know, 90, 90 pages in or thereabouts. Uh, and it's a bit like how memory works, you know, you sort of, if you're trying to remember something, what happens? Well, you, you try and focus on images. You, you kind of gauge, you know, what's, what's coming in and, and yeah. what's true and yeah. what's, uh, is that, was that part of your uh, intention? Yeah, I think this book a little bit resembles how my memory works, actually. Mm -hmm. My memory has never been, you know, Thursday I did this. Friday I did this, Saturday. <laughs> yeah. My memory is much more fluid and much more, um, yeah, it just feels much more difficult to, to pin down. Um, so when we're reading it, I think it, it should feel a little bit like we're partly in my head, but also partly in the head of someone who's who has gone through a uh, a, a loss of a dear one, because of course the structure of different voices means that there are, there's a speed, there are different yeah. voices colliding, but something else happens. Of course, is also that the book is full of void, of pauses, of emptiness. One could say, you know, that that. Yeah, well, you've got lots of little, you know, the, uh, what would you call them, little asterisks between exactly. the short takes. On yeah, what, yeah, yeah. And what, hap what, what is that? Well, maybe that's where Samuel is, you know, in those voids. Maybe, maybe he is... It's lost in translation. Yeah, lost in, in those asterisks or, or present in the fact that he... That everything that people remember... For everything that people remember, there are so many things that they choose to omit. And maybe that's where he really is. The things that people choose not to remember. Mm, yeah. Sort of definition by absence, or yeah. now that's what it, obviously that's what a novelist does too. Is you you select the details. Yeah. It's up to you to choose the ones that you think are the, you know most accurate to what you want to say. Yeah. Or closest yeah. to what you want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Stockholm is an important character. I wonder if you could. Just Describe that character. Yeah. Uh, I think of Stockholm a little bit as a character of the novel because... Uh, I would say, like, I was born and raised in Stockholm. I love my hometown. I kind of see really problematic things about it as well. Um, I see economic boundaries that were not there when I was a kid. As I've Obviously, economic boundaries, I mean, like, you know, rich people living... Close to rich people, poor people live in poor areas. Yeah. And uh, I also see very few meeting places, very few space, spaces where people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, ages kind of are able to speak or communicate to each other. Like, like where would be an uh, example? I don't know. You tell me. What would that be? Well, I'm t you know, I'm thinking of maybe like a city Club, square or city a square or like yeah, I think it's in a segregated city, um, kind of the, the lack of those kind of meeting spaces are, um, yeah, are just like driving people apart even more. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that one of the things that the novel does is that they take a number of like the grandmother, the girlfriend, the best friend, and kind of make force them to meet through Samuel you know that this mm. is the place where they meet like their, their voices <laughs> meet through Samuel yeah kind of a, a common tragedy yeah and it's so funny to write about a city where that is also you know it has this reputation of being so beautiful mm. and lots of bridges and water clean and, and the Venice of the north mm. is, is the slogan of the city and then to also show that there are you know, there are, there are other sides to this city. There yeah. are dark, darker sides, discrimination aspects of the city, and and to show that, um, yeah, to show something that is not part of the official image is is I've I've always found that intriguing to to try to do that in my writing. Yeah, what is this about Scandinavian noir? Like, why is it? Why? I don't know. Do you mean the success, or why, yeah, I why mean, they keep writing? Why they keep? Or? Well, I guess they keep writing about <laughs> it because it's so successful. But yeah. I just wonder why, uh, why, why it's there, and uh, is it is it because of the I don't know the lifestyle there, or is it because of? Uh, well, I mean, I think 
crime fiction is, is you know, it's very popular anyway. Yeah. But but to have that part of the world associated with it, it's. it's I just wonder why. Maybe it's linked to this kind of old school idea of the Nori countries as a paradise, and then. You know, even in paradise, these terrible things happen. So it's yeah, it's kind of unexpected. Maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. that's it. Maybe Nordic writers are really good at writing crime. I'm not sure. There's a big, quite a long tradition of it, like well-written crime as well. Like I'm, a, I'm not a part of that scene at all. But of course, I have a huge respect for those people who, you know, they're also writing away and doing their thing. But mm. it's. Um, and it's spreading to television big time, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I just find that it's quite far from, from what I'm trying to do. Yeah, so I'm not sure. You, uh, you have a lot of U.S. popular culture, American popular culture references in this, uh, in this novel. I, I, did you change it, or was they, were they originally there? No, we're really influenced by the States. It's you like, are? Okay, yeah. just like Canada. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just like... Uh, Mm. To go to Sweden and speak with like an accent, like an American accent, is very. It gives you a lot of linguistic power, so to speak. It's like a high status thing, you know. To to have an American accent. Yeah, to speak like Swedish with an American accent is like looked upon as really cool, and you know we have like a lot of Swedish brands with American names in order to give kind of an air of Americana. Despite who's in office right now. Yeah, yeah, I think that. One of the things that, one of the ambitions with this novel was just to tell the story of a few contemporary people living in Stockholm. And then you have to be honest about what they're listening to, what they're reading, yeah. or, you know. And a big part of that is music, of course, and what they wear. And, and so. Here's just a, a line in, in the novel that I liked It's when you're in love, cliches make sense. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the things that I, when I was. When I was younger, I remember listening to a lot of like, you know, old school soul songs and just thinking, this is lame ass writing. Like, this is not how you write about love because, you know, it was just like... Uh, sappy. Sappy, you know. And then falling in love in the f for the first time when I was yes. like 18, I was just like, this <laughs> is the most beautiful song, <laughs> you know. Yes. It's amazing. And it's, it's, it's interesting how when you're in this kind of... Maybe it's generally true. Like when you're in an emotional state, all those kind of all those cliches ring true. Um, yeah. And then you need the maybe you even need the comfort of those cliches to feel like you're part of something bigger. I'm not sure. Uh, so that was one thing that I wanted. I wanted not to try to actually write about how it feels, even though I come close to cliche from time to time. To actually, well, if it's a, what happens if I write down that cliche? Because I. I when I was a teenager, to write something that went so close to kind of cliche would be very uh, unlike me, one could say. Well, I think it's just bad writing. If, it is, if you yeah. write a cliche, it's like yeah. you haven't, it's like no thinking. Yeah, but maybe there's a way to make that cliche vibrate with energy somehow. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But, yeah. but I think there are writers that I admire that manage to write poorly really well. How's that again? <laughs> I think that the, there are writers that I admire who write poorly really well. Write sort of with cliché written... Write, yeah, they manage to write... Who are they? Uh, I would say some, someone like the Norwegian writer Carl Uwe Knausgård is a good mm. example. Mm. Someone who's... So to explain myself, I would say that he's, he's able to in, kind of import the unevenness of his writing and the fact that he sometimes write poorly and that becomes a sign of his personality and a sign of a feeling of closeness to him as a writer. Yeah, he's that, ordinary, you mean you can relate to him. Yeah, maybe that's it. That he becomes us. You know, he, yeah. he's also prone to, to, to using this sappy language or this this lame ass cliche or and it, it's actually part of the bigger project that, that he doesn't have time to go back and be smart. So it's things. easy to write long. It's hard to write short. Yeah, I think yeah. he he uh, he has another way of thinking of speed. But I think a lot of his projects in the My Struggle books are, are linked to this, you know, the ambition that he had to write them quickly. And what happens if you force yourself to write quickly? Well, it becomes uneven, but it also become 
it becomes lifelike because mm-hmm. life is uneven, life is a boring. And it's also quite compelling to read it. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's, I, it's, those series are, I think it's one of the things that have made me think the most lately. You know, I, it's really not interesting if it's good or bad. It's just like something, if you read something that makes you think, it's, you know, it's, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And something that keeps you, keeps you engaged, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit because because we're dealing with with uh, with memory yeah. and time. I want to talk a bit about Proust. Yeah, his view of literature um, is that the artist's task is to release from the uh, buried world of un- unconscious memory the ever living reality to which habit makes us blind. Do you agree with that? I'm not sure I understand it. Could you say it again? Yeah. The artist's task is to release from the buried world of the unconscious Mm -hmm. memory Mm -hmm. the uh, ever-living reality to which habit makes us blind. So in other words, Mm -hmm. we're kind of sleepwalking through life Mm -hmm. because of habit. Yeah. And... uh, you, the artist, it's your job to uh, wake yeah. us up. Mm. Yeah. I know that I, as a reader, uh, whenever I've read something that I know I will keep in my life forever, it has been, the feeling has been that I come out of the f- fictional world with new eyes, that I kind of see the world in a new light, or that I... It feels like I, those texts are kind of living inside me in some weird way. Mm. I think it would be very tricky to create anything if you started off with thinking of Proust or having like a clear ambition. This is what I'm going to do today. You know, I'm just going to make life come alive for a potential reader. I have a much more um, down-to-earth ambition. It's just if I can get through a day writing something that has energy, I'm very happy. And then those things with energy tend to deal with things that I love, that, that I'm interested in. They, they tend to be about you know, subjects linked to my own life, of course. But, but, um, but you're interested in memory. What else are you interested in? Well, memory is one thing. I guess language and power is another thing that keeps coming back. Um, power, the, the language is power to what? Well, the, how much power language can give you and also the moment when you kind of start using a language uh, in the wrong way how you can become powerless that's also a thing that keeps coming back in my writing what does that mean it simply means that i'm about maybe 72 percent of myself when i'm sitting here speaking to you you know i speak english english is not my mother tongue i'm you're smarter in Swiss, Swedish. <laughs> I'm. I'm a, You're pretty smart in English. <laughs> no, no. no I, I just find it interesting to, to to having a look at like what what words mm, do to you. Basically, I think that it just keeps. I don't know why, but it keeps coming back in my writing. There's like people keep, I guess, using language as a way to change the world around them, or maybe change how they how, view how they themselves. Do that? Um, well, for example, I've written one novel, or it's not both a novel and a play called I Call My Brothers. And then during 24 hours, we're in the head of someone who works, walks around his hometown thinking that everyone thinks that he is a criminal or that he is a terrorist. So the city has been placed under, it's like a, during 24 hours, the city has been struck by a terrorist attack. Mm-hmm. The main character, we never know who. We get to know him through his thoughts. He's convinced that everyone thinks that he's part of this. That he's paranoid. Well, that's the question. Is he paranoid or is the police who are watching him paranoid? Like, so he he walks around a city full of fear. And the question is, is he the fearful one or are they, like, who's the the paranoid one? I think that's that's the question. And how does language, language figure into that? Well, the thing is, he's by himself for 24 hours, nothing happens, but he engages with the world through a number of people who are not physically present, but he hears their voices, one could say. Mm-hmm. So 
he has a friend who has left the city. He recalls her with the use of her voice or calls her, and then that's his way of trying to break his isolation. He has a cousin who's abroad. He uses her voice to kind of call her back. He has a grandmother mm. who's dead. He calls her back using her voice, so to speak. So mm. what I'm trying to say is just that's a thing that seems to be coming back. I'm not sure why, but... So you, you're not alone then? You... Well, sadly enough, he's even more alone because he needs to... He misses them? He's not able to have their physical presence, you know, so he has to use language. And I think that we both use words to communicate. Um, I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm fascinated by this, because when you're using words, there's always this distance between you and real life. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And you can really get the feeling that sometimes when writing is going well, that you don't need the outside world. When writing is going poorly, you can feel like you should change jobs or... Just getting back to the yeah. voices. So words stand in for people. If you don't have the people around you, it's yeah. the words that are your friends. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great way of putting it. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but that, that, that's kind of a theme that I see coming back. Mm. In my first novel, his, uh, the main character's mother is, has also passed away. He writes her back in a way with, with a personal diary. In the second novel that exists in English called Montecore, A Unique Tiger, there are, it's a story about two family story about a son and a father. They are not able to be physically close, but they can write about and to each other in all eternity. Yeah, so there's, there's something about isolation and loneliness and trying to break free with the use of words. Sometimes that work, oftentimes it, times it doesn't, but that seems to be coming back, the ambition to kind of to, to write yourself free. Well, that's one of the um the goals in writing is to, you know, E.M. Forster's famous to, you know, connect. Yeah. Um, because you are alone. Yeah. And you've had the good fortune of, of connecting with a, with a hell of a lot of people, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah. Haven't you? I mean, do you get lots of feedback from fans? And yeah. how does that make you feel? Yeah, I'm... I'm happy <laughs> when if someone says that they like my writing. I'm yeah. really happy. It's it's one of those things that I'm, you know, you're, you're one part of you, of course, is happy, and, and it's all about saying, you know, thank you. And another part of you is also have to remember that if those thank yous become too important, I don't think you will be able to write anything. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, that has been my experience. When I have thought too much about how to please someone who might say thank you, um, I find that my projects die really quickly. Yeah, you need to please so, yourself. I, I yeah, I, for me, the writing process often starts with some kind of uncertainty or, or, or feeling of not knowing something. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you're going to keep doing something for 300 and 400 pages, you need to, to be uncertain and then hopefully come out maybe a little more certain on the other side, but oftentimes not. And with everything I don't remember, one of the things that I was really curious about, like, what, what is the value of a memory? Like, how can you translate the value of a memory into financial terms? Of course not. At what point do you kind of, you know, looking at my grandmother who were kind of losing her memories, at what point will he, she cease to be her? I remember thinking about that, you know. Mm -hmm. If she had like 70% of her memories, 40, 20, 10%? Yeah. Is it still her? Like is, yeah. physically she's the same? I go there, she doesn't recognize me. And I also remember kind of trying to, speaking about acting differently in different settings, I, I remember trying to act as me with her so she, she would re recognize me as, you know, I would kind of wear have a backpack, I often have a backpack, you know, so, so that she would see me and... Feel secure. Feel secure, in a way, yeah. yeah. Was, the, was her loss your greatest loss, or was there something else that really knocked you over? Uh, I think it was the experience of, at the same time, there was something weird in the, the mirroring of the events of my grandmother being physically present, losing all of her memories. Mm. And then my friend passing away physically, 
girlfriend or boyfriend? Friend. I just just friend. Say okay. friend. Yeah, yeah, a very dear friend of mine. Um, but um, that physically, she was not around. Like her body was not around. But she kept on living in the memories of all of us who remember her. So those two events, you know, they they kind of they mirror each other in a weird way because in one setting the body is gone and the memories remain. In the other setting, the body is still here, but the memories are all gone. Yeah, it's not weird. Yeah, it's weird, right? And that happened at the same time, and it—that's why the novel looks the way it does. Just finally, uh, about Sweden again. Uh, yeah. What's going on there right now, as a, in the in the, the, the writing world? Is there anything that's any pressing issues that uh, that you're engaged with? Well, at the moment we had this big uh, chaos of the Swedish Academy. I don't know if that has made the news. In the the Nobel? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of the... That has been controlling the, the literary world in the last few weeks. So there was linked to this Me, Me Too movement. It was revealed that um, a cultural figure in Sweden with ties to the Swedish Academy had uh, sexually assaulted a number of uh, people in the cultural world for many, many years, more than 20 years. And he had the support or he had financial aid by the Swedish Academy. Mm. And the Swedish Academy, are, they are uh, choosing the Nobel Prize winners in literature. And then they started kind of a, they started a movement towards reformation or trying to, to, to change. And now that change has been stopped. And, and uh, so right now that, that's the big... Uh, I would say the big literary debate. No one really knows what happens. So normally they would be 18 in the Swedish Academy. Right now they are 10 because so many people have left. And, and so we'll see what happens. Is the Me Too movement going to work its way into your uh, fiction, do you think? I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah. Just final question then. Yeah. What, uh, what are you working on now? I just finished a new novel before yeah. coming here, yeah. So I'm a little bit high on... on on that one. It's funny, you have to talk about the old one. And you, can you talk about the new one or not, really? Well, it's, I really like this period because it's, it's secret, but it exists in, the, in my head and no one else's, you know, that's, that kind of thing. But it will be published in, in the fall in Sweden, in August. So that's, uh, it feels amazing. It's called in Swedish, Pappa Klausulen. The title in English might be The Dad Clause or The Father Clause. I'm not sure. Clause like clause like the um, you know from a a lawyer sense clause not the oh, clause, clause not the bare not clause the, no but it yeah. it works it that could way be. It could, sure yeah. yeah great well uh, let's uh, just repeat here your latest novel international bestseller is called everything I don't remember and it's published in is this North America Scribner uh, let's see. Scribner is in the UK, and in the US it's Atria. Atria? Which is part of Simon Schuster. Simon and Schuster? Yeah. Terrific. Well, thanks uh, very much for uh, allowing me to tape this so we don't have to rely on our memory Thank to you. call it back up again. Thank you. I've been speaking with Jonas Hansen-Kimiri here in Montreal, Canada. Thanks again. Thank you.